Welcome to Old Treasures Made New, your devotional podcast on the go or at home, where we read the scriptures and reflect on them with those from the past. Today we'll be reading Matthew 11, verses 16 to 24, and then through J.C. Ryle's expository thoughts on Matthew. Please take a moment to pause and to ask the Holy Spirit to bring understanding and to apply what we hear. Matthew, chapter 11, verses 16 to 24. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. And the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazon! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? you will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. This is the word of the Lord. These sayings of the Lord were called forth by the state of the Jewish nation when he was upon earth. But they speak loudly also to us, as well as to the Jews. They throw great light on some parts of the natural man's character. They teach us the perilous state of many immortal souls in the present day. The first part of these verses shows us the unreasonableness of many unconverted men in the things of religion. The Jews, in our Lord's time, found fault with every teacher whom God sent among them. First came John the Baptist preaching repentance an austere man, a man who withdrew himself from society and lived an aesthetic life. Did this satisfy the Jews? No. They found fault and said, He is a devil. Then came Jesus, the Son of God, preaching the gospel, living as other men lived and practicing none of John the Baptist's peculiar austerities. And did this satisfy the Jews? No. They found fault again and said, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. In short, they were as perverse and hard to please as contrary children. It is a mournful fact that there are always thousands of professing Christians just as unreasonable as these Jews. They are equally perverse and equally hard to please. Whatever we teach and preach, they find fault. Whatever be our manner of life, they are dissatisfied. Do we tell them of salvation by grace and justification by faith? At once they cry out against our doctrine as licentious and antinomian. Do we tell them of the holiness which the gospel requires? At once they exclaim that we are too strict and precise and righteous overly. Are we cheerful? They accuse us of levity. Are we grave? They call us gloomy and sour. Do we keep aloof from balls and races and plays? They denounce us as puritanical, exclusive, and narrow-minded? Do we eat and drink and dress like other people and attend to our worldly callings and go into society? They sneeringly insinuate that they see no difference between us and those who make no religious profession at all, and that we are not better than other men. What is all this but the conduct of the Jews over again? We play the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang the dirge, and you did not mourn. He who spoke these words knew the hearts of men. The plain truth is that true believers must not expect unconverted men to be satisfied either with their faith or their practice. If they do, they expect what they will not find. They must make up their minds to hear unnecessary objections and excuses, however holy their own lives may be. Well, says Quesnel, whatever measures good men take, They will never escape the censures of the world. The best way is not to be concerned at them.
After all, what says the scripture? The mind of the flesh is hostile towards God. The natural man doesn't receive the things of God's Spirit. Romans 8 verse 7 and 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14. This is the explanation of the whole matter. The second part of these verses shows us the exceeding wickedness of willful impenitence. Our Lord declares that it will be more tolerable for Tyre, Sidon, and Sodom in the day of judgment than for those towns where people had heard his sermons and seen his miracles, but not repented. There is something very solemn in this saying. Let us look at it well. Let us think for a moment what dark, idolatrous, immoral, squandering places Tyre and Sidon must have been. Let us call to mind the unspeakable wickedness of Sodom. Let us remember that the cities named by our Lord, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, were probably no worse than other Jewish towns, and in any case, were far better than Tyre, Sidon, and Sodom. And then let us observe that the people of Chorazan, Bethsaida, and Capernaum are to be in the lowest hell because they heard the gospel and yet did not repent because they had great religious advantages and did not use them. How dreadful this sounds. Surely these words ought to make the ears of everyone tingle who hears the gospel regularly and yet remains unconverted. How great is the guilt of such a man before God! How great the danger in which he daily stands! Moral and decent and respectable as his life may be, he is actually more guilty than the idolatrous Tyrian or Sidonian or a miserable inhabitant of Sodom. They had no spiritual light. He has and neglects it. They heard no gospel. He hears but does not obey it. Their hearts might have been softened if they had enjoyed his privileges. Tyre and Sidon would have repented. Sodom would have remained to this day. His heart under the full blaze of the gospel remains hard and unmoved. There is but one painful conclusion to be drawn. His guilt will be found greater than theirs at the last day. Most true is the remark of an English bishop. Among all the aggravations of our sins, there is none more heinous than the frequent hearing of our duty. May we all think often about Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum. Let us settle it in our minds that it will never do to be content with merely hearing and liking the gospel. We must go further than this. We must actually repent and be converted. We must actually lay hold on Christ and become one with Him. Until then, we are in dreadful danger. It will prove more tolerable to have lived in Tyre, Sidon, and Sodom than to have heard the gospel in England and at last died unconverted. That is the end of Ryle's expository thoughts for these verses. Let us carefully consider what we've heard today, and may the Lord be pleased to bring the growth for His.